Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this public lecture. I'm Jeremy Bradshaw. I'm one of the Pro Vice Chancellors here at the University of Bath. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Heike Solger and tonight's panelists, Dr. Chiara Benassi and Tony Burke. And I'm very pleased that you've all joined us for this event this evening. Professor Solger is not only a world leading scholar and prominent researcher in education inequalities and labor market outcomes. She's also one of two appointments in this year's Global Chair Program, whose work is especially concerned with widening access and participation. Our university has been fortunate to build a considerable research profile in this field, but it is, it is also an important priority for our own institutional practice. We're therefore excited about the opportunity to work with someone of Professor Solger's reputation to inspire and enhance our own approach. I'm grateful to my academic colleagues here at Bath, Professor Hugh Lauder in the Department of Education and Professor Lynn Prince-Cook in the Department for Social and Policy Sciences for nominating Professor Solger as Global Chair and to the International Relations Office for organizing the scheme, which has allowed us to build some fantastic international partnerships and foster new collaborations within our university community. We're very honored to be able to host Professor Solger, albeit virtually at this time. And I very much look forward to hearing more about this evening's discussion on Germany's vocational training system and what we can learn from its support for our young generation during these difficult times. I'm going to shut up in a moment, but I'd just like to thank the Pol Institute for Policy Research and its director, Nick Pierce, for hosting the event. And I'd now like to hand over to Nick for his words of introduction. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, as Jeremy noted, I'm, I'm Nick Pierce. I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Research at the University of Bath and a professor of public policy. And I'm, I'm delighted uh, this evening to be able to chair uh, our proceedings to introduce Professor Solger um, and then our respondents, Dr. Chiari Benassi and Tony Burke. Uh, professor Solger is director of the research unit Skill Formation in the Labour Market at the Wissenschaft zu Berlin and Professor of Sociology at the Free University Berlin. Um, and she's one of the world's foremost scholars of research into marginalized uh, educational populations um, with a particular interest in vocational training uh, and its impact on social mobility and career trajectories. And she's currently leading a, a major project on educational inequality and uh, university admissions in Germany. And these issues are of particular interest to us um, because in the UK there is uh, the, recently the return of, of, of a very familiar debate about how to improve vocational education and training, uh, the creation of uh, new apprenticeship routes for those who don't go uh, to uh, university and as well as those actually who do come through universities on vocational and apprenticeship pathways. Um, and that's a familiar debate because it's one that we've had for many, many years. And often in that debate, uh, we are asked to look across to Germany, to look at its apprenticeship system and to uh, draw insights from it. And sometimes people go further and say that we should try to import it wholesale. Uh, and so some of these questions about the German apprenticeship system, how it works, the political economy uh, of the apprenticeship system are what we can think uh, is po possible and plausible to learn here, as well as things which can't be simply imported into the British labor market and into a more, if you like, liberal market economy uh, are issues that we want to discuss this evening. And so I'm very pleased that we'll be following uh, Professor Solger's remarks with uh, comments from Dr. Chiara Benassi, who joins us from King's Business School at King's College London, uh, where she's a senior lecturer in human resource management, researching the areas of comparative human resource management and comparative employment relations. So a big welcome to Dr. Chiara Benassi. Uh, and also joining us is Tony Burke, who's um, Assistant General Secretary of Unite the Union, obviously the biggest union uh, in the UK, and President of the Confederation of Shipbuilding Engineering Unions, uh, and uh, a member of the British TUC General Council. Uh, and Tony um, has a wealth of experience on vocational apprenticeship 
uh, policy and brings, I think, a the very important perspective of trade unions uh, and young workers, young apprentices to uh, our discussion this evening. So uh, uh, Dr. Chiara Benassi and Tony Burke will give some responses and then we'll have the opportunity uh, to debate these questions, have some Q&A. Um, if you've got some uh, questions, do put them into the, uh, the Q&A and we will do our best to pull them out and put them to our uh, uh, panelists. Um, and I should just also say by way of housekeeping before we start, um, your cameras and microphone phones will re remain switched off um, and the session is being recorded so filming and photography is taking place and subject to there being no um, technical difficulties will make it online available as a, as a podcast and a video uh, at a later stage. So uh, that's probably enough from me. Thank you again for, for joining us. And now I'd like to pass over to Professor Solga for her presentation. Professor Solga. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jeremy, for the uh, kind introduction. Thank you also for appointing me to the Global Share in Sociology for this year. And um, before I proceed, I will share my screen for the presentation. Okay. Okay. I hope that you can all see them. Um, so what I would like to do tonight is not so much to explain you what the German apprenticeship system is. I guess many of you know it's film-based. It lasts uh, for about three years. It is open to all uh, school leavers, independent of the of their school leaving certificate, and it's uh, that uh, young people apply to firms and firms select. And one uh, major point, of course, is that it is um, part of our collect collective bargaining, so the trade unions and the employer associations are participating in this process of apprenticeship uh, uh, setup uh, in terms of which occupations, but also in terms of the kind of contracts apprentices get. What I would like to do tonight is um, to point to three points. And one is to tell you a little bit about the strengths and the weaknesses uh, of the German uh, apprenticeship system, at least from my point. I'm a sociologist of education. And of course, we often look uh, very closely to questions of inequality. And then I think there are two major issues that are uh, discussed nowadays. And that is the challenge uh, of the apprenticeship system due to the digital transformation of work and uh, unfortunately also of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I will also tell a little bit uh, on that because these are major, major issues or as I call it my lecture, they might be problems for the German system. Okay, let me start with the uh, uh, first point, so kind of the advertisement of the German system with the strength. And one that comes up uh, again and again is that the, uh, based on the or, or connected to the firm based training, uh, we see usually very low unemployment rates in these countries. That uh, is not only Germany, it's also Austria and Switzerland, who have, uh, which have similar systems. And I show you here the, the figures for the financial crisis, so in two, uh, the unemployment rates um, in 2012. And what you see, they are very low. Uh, if you look closer, then you also see that the countries that have low uh, unemployment rates are also the countries that did quite well during the financial crisis. So it's not. On this slide, it would be not clear whether it's a general economic situation or whether it's really the system of apprenticeships that keeps the unemployment rates, uh, youth unemployment rates low. And I would say there is some issue to the institutional setting keeping the unemployment rates low. First thing is that we not only have an apprenticeship system, but we have compulsory vocational education until age 18. So, even young people would like to go to work. They are, there's mandatory at least part-time uh, education, so they 
couldn't go full time to work. Secondly, uh, the majority of our young people uh, do start uh, with the apprenticeship system uh, program or with the university program. And the ones that are unsuccessful, so they do not start an apprenticeship or, or study program, they participate in pre vocational programs. So if you think about uh, what, what is the potential risk of young people to get unemployed, it's very low until the early 20s in Germany. And I think that is, so we keep them as long as possible, you could say, in education. Um, that is one thing. The second um, strength of the system that is uh, shown in many studies is that uh, young people have faster and smooth entry into skilled jobs. So it's not like job shopping. So they do their apprenticeship and then start right away with a skilled job at a skilled level. We have uh, connected to that less uh, young people in need. So not employment, in employment, education and training. And I think that's a big, at least as I know from my British colleagues, that is a big issue in the UK. And then also having this uh, vocational education and training and the certificate, also uh, there are many studies showing that it uh, is a kind of a safety net. So it keeps you more or less on, on the skilled work level. Um, and lower the risk of uh, doing a lot of uh, low skill jobs over your employment career. The third um, advantage that is more, you could say for the economy, but it's also for the people who will become specialists is that they are trained in occupation specific skills. And here you see only for the firm based training sector, we have uh, currently 325 different occupations. And what you also see is that most of them are really highly specialized. And there is only a, a smaller share of occupations that are more broader and then you specialized in the last year. And connected to that is also that it, uh, the, the system itself produces a strong linkage to firms. So more than two thirds of the apprentices, apprenticeship graduates are hired by their training firm afterwards. That is partly due to collective agreement. So we have uh, for some sectors, uh, firms have to uh, hire their uh, apprentices at least for six months or a year. But if you look in the statistics, it's more than this enforced uh, uh, hiring. It's also for longer term. Then uh, money is also an issue. And here I show you the monthly gross earning of full-time employed apprenticeship graduates uh, two years after their graduation. And what you see is these are the, the red bars. Uh, what you see is quite high, also compared to the blue bars, it's uh, the all employed, full time employees with a, a vocational education degree. So already at the start, uh, the, the, the apprenticeship graduates earn quite some money. And also, if you compare the blue bars and the dark blue bar, that is the average over all full time employed. Uh, uh, adult, you see that uh, what you might know, the wage, rather uh, wage compression in Germany, so that the ones who do an apprenticeship also earn quite some uh, decent income. However, um, one also has to be uh, honest, uh, we have huge differences uh, between the occupations. So a graduate who, who did a program and uh, as an industrial mechanic earns already almost the average, while the hairdressers and beauticians are very little, if, and that is for full-time employed, right? But still. So that were the strengths. And now we come to the weaknesses. 
and for the weaknesses, I said that um, on the one hand, it is uh, the apprenticeship system provides some safety net so that over the career, you do find uh, jobs at the skilled workers level. However, there is, of course, uh, if more people are trained, there is, of course, also a higher overeducation risk. And that are, is uh, statistics where you see, um, again, graduates with, from, from vocational education and training two years after their graduation, and uh, how many of them or the, the share that, of them that is employed in low skill jobs for which they wouldn't have needed any training, right? And this is, as you see in total, it's, uh, it's about one fifth uh, um, of the young people who uh, work in low skill jobs. And interestingly, this share is higher for men than for young women. And um, if you look here, I, I show you the over-education, uh, the shares of, of over-education for some occupations. And what you do see here, these are more the male-dominated jobs. And here again, you see the industrial mechanics. They have a rather high uh, proportion of, um, of not doing or not working in their, um, in a job that corresponds to their training, but in a low skilled job. And if you look at the other side of the distribution, you see much more the female dominated occupations. And here again, you see the hairdressers. So they earn little, but they stay in their occupation. And here also the physician assistant. So that is some issue. If in Germany you don't have a degree, it gets real, and you don't find a job in your training degree, then you have a quite high risk to be employed in low skill jobs. Um, one of the major issues of about the last five to ten years is uh, what I call the loss of attractiveness. What you see here is uh, these are the, the, in, the new enrollments into apprenticeship positions, into the so-called school-based systems. That is, it has a different government, but it's also occupation specific. It has also practical parts in firms or in hospitals because uh, this is actually the system where we train our nurses, our kindergarten teachers, our social workers, etc. And then this is uh, the, the new enrollments in university. And what you do see is over the last 20 years, we had a huge increase in uh, entering university. Uh, and we had a decrease in entering vocational training. Now, these figures also depend on the size of the birth cohorts, et cetera. And therefore, here you see the huge decrease of the apprenticeship uh, system uh, for a new enrollment in relative terms. So 20 years ago, about 57% uh, uh, of enrollments were in the firm-based system. Nowadays, it's about 44%. And that uh, what we see is the steady decline and we see a steady uh, increase in uh, ex uh, entering university. Um, then going to the other side of the distribution of the high uh, achieving school leavers who can choose between university and vocational training, but to go to the low achieving school leavers, um, this system, there is a risk of, of, we do see that the system is not as inclusive as, as it is uh, perceived from the outside. So yes, the dual, all school leavers are entitled to enter an apprenticeship. As I said in the beginning, there is no formal uh, entitlement uh, in terms of school leaving degree. De facto, of course, we have an apprenticeship market. So you apply to firms and the firms select like they do in the labor market. 
And so what we do see then for our low achieving school leavers and low achieving school leavers in Germany are those who leave the school with only a lower secondary degree, either after grade nine or grade 10, that depends on the federal states, uh, how long compulsory education is. But so um, are they can school leavers uh, without a school degree. And what you see here is, these are again new enrollments, but now also um, broadened by an issue that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, pre-vocational measures. So as I said, um, those young people who are not able to enter an apprenticeship or do not enter um, school-based uh, vocational training, they more or less have to enter pre-vocational measures because of the compulsory education, but also uh, because of the gatekeeping of the federal employment agency. And what you do see for the low achieving school leavers, it's, uh, it's especially for the ones without a school leaving degree, uh, it's only uh, less than one third who really can enter the uh, apprenticeship system. For those with a lower secondary degree, it's a little bit better. But what you do see is a high share of uh, pre-vocational training measures. And maybe I should also tell you about 20% uh, of a cohort nowadays leave school with, uh, with uh, a lower secondary school degree or no school degree. I will also show you how it looks if you, uh, for the young people who leave school with higher school degrees. This is the one, these are the ones with an intermediate school degree. That is, uh, you could say, the typical apprentice. That's the one that the uh, um, terms really like. Um, and here you see it's only 13% that enter pre vocational measures, and that is mainly due to regional uh, mismatches. So that, um, of course, in areas where you have a larger supply of young people than you have uh, training uh, places, uh, they are somewhat parked in the pre-vocational program. We do also have uh, young people with a university entrance qualification or what you would call the A-level in the UK that enter um, the vocational training system. And what you see is uh, only very few do not manage to find uh, a school-based training place or a firm-based training place. I should say that uh, especially for this population, there are some occupations like the bank clerk or IT uh, specialist for which uh, the firms really require the Abitur, the university entrance qualification. Now, I should also give you some numbers. So it's not a little, it's really, it's about 200,000 young people every year entering the pre-vocational uh, measurement program. So, uh, this it's not only the vocational training and the apprenticeship system that uh, keeps our unemployment rates low, but it's really also these kind of pre-vocational measures. Uh, another itch, weakness one could say is uh, I, I mentioned that a little bit uh, earlier, if you are a German without a, either a vocational training degree or a university degree, you really have a high risk of being marginalized. And uh, what you see here are the unemployment rates and the people without any degree have an unemployment rate nowadays of 17%. That is five times higher than the ones with an apprenticeship degree and more than eight times higher than the ones with the university degree. And that in a time, so that is 2019, at a time where the labor market went really well and where you had a lot, where we had a lot of vacant positions. 
And it, this is only the unemployment rate, but if you also look into the long-term unemployment rate, again, many of these people without the degree uh, are uh, long-term unemployed. So very, you could say the German system also produces very early a group that is excluded from the labor market rather long-term. And uh, my last point of weakness is the dependence on firms' training commitment. I think uh, from the outside, many people believe that most of the firms in Germany train. This is not the case. What you see here is that the share, for example, in the 1980s, in the mid 1980s, the share of firms was about uh, 34%. So every third firm uh, provides training places, not every firm. And what we observed over the last 20 years is there is a steady decline in firms providing training. So in 2018, it was only about 20% uh, of the firms providing training places. And um, of course, the current situation is not a situation where this will improve. And there is some issue on uh, and debate every year about the free rider problem so that uh, some, some firms train and then other firms provide uh, higher wages and by that get the trained people. Uh, and so we do have a discussion about uh, an apprenticeship levy or something like that. But every year, um, the employers, um, employer associations uh, somewhat manage to, to avoid this. OK, now I come to um, the challenges uh, um, due to the digitalization of work. And um, so it's of course difficult because uh, most of it will be uh, in the future. Of course, uh, when digital transformation has started, uh, but still uh, many of the employment um, relationships and uh, the, uh, the jobs and the job tasks are not so much yet affected uh, as we could predict. And I think um, you might have seen that in The Guardian uh, two years ago, uh, we see all over the place these kind of, um, of fears. This is also not new. That is uh, the leading German monthly magazine, Der Spiegel. And as you could see 40 years ago, it was almost the same rhetoric and the same fear. Uh, this was not happen. Uh, so uh, technology is one thing, but of course, um, policy and uh, 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 actors and shareholders are the others and work organizations could be very different. But still, let's uh, have a close look on what are the predictions of the future. And here you see a prediction by the OECD. And what they did is actually for each occupation, they looked at what would be technologically today, that was these are uh, numbers from 2012, what would be technologically possible. So it was, uh, they abstracted from whether that will be introduced and how likely the adaptation uh, by firms is, it's just what is possible. And so you might think that is, overestimating what's happened. On the other hand, they assumed at that point that social and cognitive intelligence, perception, manipulation cannot be automated. And what we see, that we have seen since uh, uh, 2012 is that there is progress. So you might say that might be even underestimated. But uh, I think what it does show us is that uh, there will be changes and uh, they will not be minor. And I, uh, the two red arrows are, this is Germany. So German, for Germany, they predict more occupations that uh, have a risk uh, that uh, job tasks will be automated. In the UK, that is a little bit uh, smaller. So for Germany, overall, they predict 55%. Uh, 
There's also, uh, based on German data, more on the um, qualification level. So you might ask, yeah, but that is only the low skills. Now, it's not only low skill jobs. What you do see here is that the prediction is also that about 50% or 55% of the jobs that require an apprenticeship uh, could, uh, could be at least partly be automated and uh, about more than a third of these jobs have a high risk. Yet that is one thing. So the question is, um, what, what does it mean for the jobs overall? And here are the predictions for Germany. So what you do see here is what is predicted, how many jobs will we lose and how many, these are the, what is called minus, and how many jobs will we gain? Um, and this is for different years, 225, uh, 2030, and 2035. And what you do see is, yes, we lose jobs. We might lose jobs, um, but we also gain uh, jobs. And uh, if you look at the balance, that is close to zero. But of course, the jobs that we lose will not be the jobs that we gain. And for that, I think a major challenge for the um, occupation specific firm based training system in Germany is that you have that we will have higher rates of occupational mobility. And that we will have higher training needs, not only in the beginning of an educational career, but also over the career. And that brings me to to the challenges. So we have this um, tension between, on the one hand, occupation specificity, which is always uh, mentioned as a strength. And on the other hand, we do need more occupational mobility. That um, uh, refers also to the second point. So we, uh, for the long time, we thought we have this initial training, we have our occupation, and we do it over our life course but we will experience more occupational reorientation that people learn a second, a third, and maybe also a fourth occupation. I showed you that we have some issues uh, in terms of inclusion, so uh, including inclusion of um, NICA students. On the other hand, we observe uh, skill upgrading by employers, and that might, the skill upgrading might also increase uh, due to the digital transformation of uh, work. And then I think one issue is also that is little debated when it comes to, to uh, the request of, that is put forward when uh, people discuss uh, on the digitalization. The, the major point that is made is always employability, right? But education is also a social right. So we also have political education, civic engagement, etc. So there is also an increasing tension then for the apprenticeship system to, to on the one hand, deliver a skilled workforce, but on the other hand, being also an independent educational organization. We have additional triggers, of course, to digitalization. Uh, Germany faces a major uh, sociodemographic change. So we, our birth cohorts are decreasing. Uh, so we do have migration and we have aging. Um, I showed you uh, about the uh, loss of uh, attractiveness. We have increasing educational ex uh, aspirations. So uh, we do have attention for the training system to be still a major system in the future. Uh, we have the climate change, and by that, um, we, that might also affect uh, the training system. Uh, just one uh, major topic nowadays in Germany is e-mobility, e-cars. So uh, we trained a lot for the combustion engine. But for an electric car, you need much fewer workers and you need completely different workers uh, than you need for a car with a combustion engine. 
And of course, since the last year, we have the COVID pandemic. And that is the last, I will show you a very few slides for um, the challenges we face nowadays because of the pandemic. These are figures for December 2020. And in 2020, we had about one fifth of the uh, workforce in short work. Fortunately, um, th this was not the case so much for our apprentices. Uh, they could go to work and learn. But the second point is much more that should worry us. Um, so there, there are surveys of, of, uh, for firms and about 28% uh, of the firms uh, mentioned in December 2020 that they, uh, reserve for liquidity is only up to two months. So that would be actually at the end of the month. And if you look for the ones who have six months, uh, that is or it's about 50%, 53% of the firm. Six months sounds long, but six months is May. And uh, we don't know how the situation will be in May. So um, given the dependence of the German apprenticeship system on firms, uh, you can imagine that that is a, a big challenge uh, for the apprenticeship system. Um, we do observe it a little bit already in the last fall. Uh, apprenticeships always start in fall. We had a reduction of uh, apprenticeship position offers of about 9%. And um, um, also a reduction in training con contracts. And uh, I must say that uh, the predictions in, in the summer were larger than that what was uh, actually happened. Uh, that's good. Uh, we don't know how to be next fall, but what we do see is, of course, that it is very different for different occupations. So. For example, for travel agents, there were 59% less contracts signed for apprenticeship. For event management assistant, it was 63. And also in industry, the uh, tool mechanics, we uh, saw uh, much uh, less uh, contracts uh, for apprenticeship uh, places. What would be the expectation mid and long term? Um, yeah, so there is a huge uncertainty about the survival of firms, especially small firms. And small firms, one must say, are somewhat also the backbone of the system, especially for the low achieving school leavers. So the craft occupations are mostly trained there. And uh, what is also a little bit new, and there was a big boost in Germany, I must say, on consumer behavior. So we have much more online shopping, internet shopping, much more online banking, uh, et cetera. So there was, and that of course also had then uh, an impact for jobs in certain uh, sectors. And if it has an impact on jobs, it also has automatically an impact on apprenticeships and apprenticeship places to be offered. And so, yeah, possible consequences could be that we see a decrease in apprenticeship offers. We might see termination of existing contracts, either because of firm closure, but also because young people observe that for some of the training occupations in situations like the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the work situation is much worse than for those who have a university degree, can do uh, home office work, don't, uh, do not lose uh, that quickly their job, et cetera. So there might be also more terminations of contracts. And of course, we might see uh, a decrease of employment after graduation. So for the future, that might increase the vulnerability of training trajectories. And if that is the case, it might also then be like a self-fulfilling prophecy, further decrease the attractiveness of the system. Okay, let me conclude. So does the German system can cope with these uh, 
challenges uh, due to uh, the digitalization of work, due to climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic? I don't know. I mean, if we follow a new tour, we all don't know. But what I certainly know that the future of the German system is not fate, but uh, can be determined politically. And I think the, the big strength of the system is that the social partners are involved in the system. So for the time being, there is a big, uh, um, there, there are uh, big efforts to support training firms. Um, there are collective bargaining and agreements about how to deal with the digitalization and with the COVID-19 pandemic. As a sociologist, I would say um, all of the firms have to learn to see the potential of low achieving school leavers because our research shows there's a huge overlap uh, between cognitive and non-cognitive skills between the low achieving youth and the intermediate achieving youth. So there are many young people in this category for whatever reason, but not because they are not good in math and mathematics and reading or because of problematic um, social behavior. And I think the, the large challenge will be uh, for the German system to adapt the occupation specific uh, uh, occupation specificity. So on the one hand to keep that uh, model, but on the other hand to increase all the options for occupational mobility. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, Professor Solker, for that um, really fantastic lecture. And it, it gives us a, some real um, context there on that evolution history of the German apprenticeship model and how it's changed, but also you cast that forward into the future, the challenges of digitalization, what we would think of as the gig economy uh, in the UK, and then the kind of impact of a, of a critical juncture like the COVID crisis on these kinds of um, pathways and how they might be resettled into the future. And as you said in your conclusions there, you know, the, the, these are political questions. They are not simply uh, technological or economic questions that have no political component. They are amenable to political intervention. So uh, thank you very much indeed for that. And I'm going to ask now Chiara Benassi uh, from King's College London to come in with the first response to Professor Solga's lecture. Chiara. Thanks a lot, uh, Nick. So I think I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, can you see it? Okay. Great. So first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, thanks to the Institute for Policy Research and thanks Heike for the very interesting and detailed lecture on, um, on the German vocational training system. Um, I was invited today to provide um, a comparative uh, perspective to um, to these uh, to to, to the le ICAS lecture, and uh, in particular, so I want to talk about the British vocational training system that I had the opportunity to study um, in a comparative project funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. And um, what struck me most um, when I started studying the British vocational training system was the large amount of reforms um, that the system uh, underwent in the last 30 years. Um, and all these reforms um, cite the German system as a source of inspiration. And if we take uh, the last um, reform, the apprenticeship levy reform, um, we have seen a shift from national vocational qualification to trailblazer standards, which made apprenticeships more complex and longer. And um, the standard, and so more similar to the German apprenticeships, the standards are developed by employers um, together with sometimes their association and the Institute of Apprenticeship. And there is a final external assessment uh, similar to the HIACA um, assessment in Germany. Um, the government has also tried to ensure a uh, large employer's commitment um, through the apprenticeship levy. We have just uh, heard that in Germany there is no levy um, and, they, and that employer's commitment, especially I would say between among small and medium 
uh, size enterprises has been declining over time, uh, but the large and the commitment of large employers um, um, is usually um, due to some societal expectations on one side, but also collective agreements. Um, the last skills for jobs paper, which was released this month, also envisages um, a future, uh, a, gr a greater role for the chambers of commerce um, for coordinating employers and training providers at the local level, also similar to Germany. Um, however, um, I would say that uh, my argument is that the German, the British system will never become like the German system because of very different underlying principles. Um, the state um, has been quite uh, active in regulating um, the, um, the training arena and in creating a quasi market for training which should deliver um, good value for money to employers. Um, it's a quasi market and not a market as we often uh, refer to in political economy because the state actively shapes its rules and shapes also the distribution of funding. In fact, before uh, the levy reform, public funding will go directly to private training providers, which dominate uh, the, the training, the vocational training market. So this made private training providers unresponsive to employers' demand. Uh, with the apprenticeship levy, uh, large employers who pay the levy, they have their own account, so they can pay private training providers directly and affect, so influence their educational offer more directly. But given that train and tra training providers are private and so for profit, this is more difficult for small employers who um, still depend on public funding. And in general, it is difficult when employers do not have a critical mass of apprentices to send to the training providers every year, especially in tech for technical training, which requires a big investment in infrastructures. And this, um, this problem, this, uh, this coordination problem be between training providers and, and employers is made worse by very weak network among, firm, among firms, they, which are unable to coordinate their skill demands and also uh, weak connections between firms and training providers, despite um, the government has launched several local skill initiatives to enhance it. So uh, probably given, um, given, given this background, so the government has now suggested uh, an enhanced role of the Chambers of Commerce. And finally, so employers, as I just uh, explained, so they develop their standards, they uh, pay through their own levy accounts, the private training providers, so they very much own the system. They are in the driving seat and unions, uh, differently from Germany, they play a minor role or a, a, a no role at all. In fact, there is very limited union involvement. So these distinctive characteristics uh, represent um, so pose certain challenges uh, in times of digital transformation and in times of crisis. So we have just heard from Heike uh, that there has been a drop uh, in uh, apprenticeship starts uh, in Germany. Uh, quasi markets um, being markets, they are even probably they are even react even more uh, and are even more vulnerable to economic down cycles. Um, and so between April and July 2020, there has been a drop by 37% already funded starts compared to 2019. Um, we have, um, um, this obviously poses uh, uh, the question of future skill gaps, which is particularly problematic given, given the digital transformation, but also it poses um, the objective of apprenticeship as social inclusion instrument at risk. Um, this is a rather bleak um, scenario. So I also think, however, that um, uh, the crisis and the, the, um, the requirement of the digital transformation um, have been an opportunity, uh, have represented an opportunity to appreciate the value 
of greater state intervention in the labor market uh, in, uh, in the UK. So the government has launched uh, the lifetime skill guarantee, which will be important for upskilling um, workers throughout their career, which is one of the challenges of digital transformation. Uh, Heike just talked about occupational mobility. Um, this is definitely related to that. Um, the government in the last Skills for Jobs strategy paper also uh, introduced the um, uh, possibility for the state to intervene uh, to correct market failures. So when training providers do not deliver high quality provision or when they do not deliver the skills at the local level because maybe there are not enough employers. And the state also in the crisis um, provided subsidies to hire and keep apprentices and also provided additional funding uh, targeted to training young people without employment. So really like trying to maintain social inclusion goals of, uh, of the vocational training system. Um, my finally, so despite this um, greater, this increase in state intervention in the vocational training arena, uh, employer ownership remains a leading principle. And um, on one hand, I think we can argue that large employers, large employers who have the market power will find easier than German employers to update the training standards because they are really in the driving seat. And it will be probably easier for them to request training providers to include specific skills or so digital skills, for example, in their curriculum because markets are more responsive to changes in demand than the public sector uh, and pu than public schools, for example, as it would be the case in Germany. Um, at the same time, I think that the employer, the employer ownership principle might undermine um, some of the, um, of the goals of the apprenticeship system, which is to socially include um, uh, low academic achievers and also to, um, to provide high quality training, especially in, in times of digital, uh, of, of changes uh, in, in the world of work, such as the digital transformation. There are ways to correct um, this, um, uh, the, the employers focus on, on, on cost, which might undermine this. Um, and in the, in the German system, uh, they are uh, the, um, the important role of the unions. So the, uh, the collect collective bargaining and social dialogue sort of counterbalance employers' pressures, for example, to make training more specific or shorter um, or to uh, train fewer workers. Um, and another example is the Austrian case where um, uh, Austria has a similar system to the German system where the state actually um, has um, started um, providing supra company apprenticeship paths uh, which are of comparable quality. So in this way, so the um, offer of apprenticeship would not be so dependent on um, economic cycles. So with, uh, which in this case, in the case of the COVID crisis, led employers to cut on apprenticeship. Um, and that was, um, that was it for me for the moment. Looking forward to the discussion and thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Chiara. That's really helpful. And it uh, brings us across to um, you know, some of these issues that are central to the debate in the UK about apprenticeships and their role. Uh, and I know Tony Burke, who's our next speaker, Tony uh, from Unite the Union, um, will want to be addressing uh, those questions. Um, uh, Tony's just joining us. Um, Tony, can we have a, a, the perspective of the trade union movement on, on these questions? And obviously Unite, which represents lots of skilled workers who've come through apprenticeship routes in the sectors mm. that have traditionally been very strong. Tony, over to you. Well, well, thanks very much, uh, Nick. And uh, first of all, can I say to everybody, thanks very much for the invite uh, to speak this evening. I think this is a very, very important uh, seminar. Um, now, I understand my CV has already been circulated and it will give, uh, give everybody um, some of my background. But I think I should also say that uh, in addition to um, 
what has been said by Nick, uh, my background in the trade union movement, I am the trade union representative, the TUC's representative on the board of, uh, of uh, Cogent, which is a chemical, uh, pharmaceutical and nuclear sets of skills body, and also on the board of Ingenuity, which is the equivalent for the engineering uh, industry, and I'm proud to be part of them. Now, both of those bodies have uh, extensive experience on apprenticeships, and a lot of my recent experience about what is going on has come through those two particular uh, bodies. Uh, and I do very much appreciate the work that's put in by the by people who sit on those boards voluntarily uh, to do um, to 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 make sure that the apprenticeship system in the UK is as good as it possibly can be. Now I've been asked to speak about what the UK can learn from the German apprenticeship system and the the dual system itself. I first had experience of the system in Germany when I visited. Uh, Germany a number of years ago uh, to study the system for about a three-day uh, visit, but I've also been on a number of occasions, of course, with different unions in Germany, not least um, in the printing industry from whence I came, and also in the metalworking sector. Now, as has been said, it's a complicated issue in some respects, but I think Heike did a brilliant job in explaining how the system works. Uh, and I think that um, it's also important to recognize that very, very important key point that apprenticeships and skills in Germany are a collective bargaining issue determined by consultation, by negotiation with the employers, trade unions uh, and the state. And I think that um, bodes very well for the situation in Germany because uh, it sets a very high benchmark for high quality training and is integrated into the German uh, social model, which I have to say um, is not the case in the UK. As uh, has just been said, trade unions have gradually been pushed out of that role uh, in apprenticeships. And I think that that's um, much to the detriment of where we need to be for the future. And there was also a reference to how COVID-19 and digital are gonna affect the apprenticeship system. I'm not going to go through the detail on that because, of course, that was covered uh, very, very well by, uh, by Heike. But one of the important things that's just been said by Chara is that German system has been continuous, largely continuous. There have been some revisions. In the UK, um, I would say that trade unions had a significant role to play in the development of apprenticeships and um, all, the F, uh, all the issues connected with uh, skills and training up until the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, it just wasn't about regulating the numbers of apprenticeships. When I was um, first a union rep at the, in, in, at the shop floor, having done my apprenticeship in the printing industry, um, it was a key issue. It was a key issue for the unions not just about regulation, but about the quality of, of training as well. And it wasn't unusual to find unions involved on, uh, uh, in colleges of further education, in joint training committees uh, and training boards, all the way through from shop floor level, right the way through uh, to the top. And I've got to say, in some instances, that is no longer the case. There are some brilliant examples uh, in the UK of top quality training schools um, in the engineering and manufacturing sector and I would just give you two examples. One is Toyota at, uh, at Derby uh, where I was there uh, last year and was very very impressed in the overall training structure of apprentice apprentices at that company and the other of course is at BMW which is no surprise at all because it's a German company um, in, in Oxford. These uh, style, these type of apprentice uh, schools and training centres provide fantastic um, uh, training and skills for young people, and not just not just about uh, the work that they do on the track or in their job, but also about a number of issues, social issues, financial management, community service, and I found it very very uh, impressive. 
Unfortunately, I think it's been said that the UK system has been almost a political football with governments um, over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, governments have used uh, promises of increasing apprenticeships uh, for political goals and in some instances have downgraded the quality of apprenticeships uh, to short-term uh, uh, training, such as, uh, such as we saw a few years ago, where uh, apprenticeships were being offered for uh, a period of three months. We had companies uh, such as, well, I won't name the name of the company, but one of the companies who are a takeaway sandwich service saying they wanted apprenticeship, apprentice uh, sandwich makers. It made a complete joke of the whole thing and, of course, damaged the brand of apprenticeships uh, um, significantly. These sort of schemes found no favour with the employers that we deal with, big employers and many, many small employers as well. The German system, as Heike said, uh, provides stability and provides an ongoing stream of skilled apprentices coming through the system, taking the place and not just in the workplace and playing a part in the workplace, but in the community um, at large. And I think the idea of uh, going to um, school students and talking about what they want to do with their future um, in terms of an apprenticeship is certainly a very, very important uh, idea. Now, in the UK, we can't just transplant this, as, a, as has been said. It's uh, very complex, but we are trying some new ideas. Uh, in ingenuity in the engineering industry, uh, we are looking to bring up a new uh, structure where school students can look at making a choice about going into a skilled apprenticeship in engineering through what we call the Skills Minor Project, uh, which gives uh, young people an opportunity to use digital technology uh, uh, to get a grasp of what it means uh, to be an engineering apprenticeship. We're very, very enthusiastic about this in the trade unions and in Unite, and we were hoping to do pilot projects last year, but of course the pandemic has stopped us doing that. Now, we've already seen a, a drop in the number of apprentices in the UK, in the manufacturing sector in particular. In some instances, by as much as uh, 50%. We've had apprentices initially being made redundant at the beginning of the pandemic, and the unions and employers and the skills bodies have said to the government, this is ludicrous. These apprentices cost in the engineering industry up to £80,000 to train, to make people redundant while they're still training was uh, quite frankly a disaster. And the government have, have tried to address that. But one of the things that we're working on with the employers, the unions and the sets of skills bodies is two things. One, making sure that the numbers of apprentices uh, coming in to manufacturing is kept high. We all know that when this pandemic is over, that when it's over and the economy takes off, if we've not got enough young apprentices in the, um, in, uh, the manufacturing sector, we won't be able to uh, take advantage of any upturn. What we'll face is like we've always faced in the UK, a skills shortage. And secondly, the number of skilled people who've already got the basic skills, who with some additional training can train in the digital side, in the green economy, leaving their jobs because they're being made redundant or their companies are closing and leaving the industry altogether will prove to be disastrous. That's why the Manufacturing Skills Alliance, which we're part of too, is saying we need a national plan on apprenticeships and also on retraining uh, uh, people who've got skills for the future. Now, Chair, I'll, I'll begin to wind up now by saying we saw the Further Education White Paper last week. Um, I've got to say it was a missed opportunity. Everything was pushed further down the road when we need help now. Manufacturing and skills in the, in the manufacturing engineering sector needs help now. And the idea, and it was referred to, of the lifetime guarantee. I'm sorry, but we just see this as being another rent -a quote from Boris Johnson without any real depth to it. We have said to the government, sit down with the 
uh, unions and the employers and the skills bodies to come up with a program that actually works. And quite frankly, we've been we've been rebuffed. Also, it's very clear, as just been said, trade unions have been pushed out. We've got thousands upon thousands of skilled people who work with apprentices, who do training, and their voices are not even heard. And I think that that uh, is not um, to the best advantage of the, of the country. Finally, uh, Chair, the apprenticeship levy. Um, I know in Germany you don't have the same thing. It's been introduced here. There were high hopes for it, but unfortunately there are some major difficulties. And we believe it's important that the money that's in the levy should be used to protect employment of apprentices and give us something, uh, give those people something uh, for the future. The digital transformation of work means that young people coming into the industry, as has been said, will need different skills. There's a big difference between uh, manufacturing a combustion engine and an electric engine in, in the car industry. Uh, we know that. And the skills for the future are going to be about cybersecurity. They're going to be green skills. They're going to be a number of other issues in, in, in regard to uh, the long term maintenance uh, uh, of equipment and uh, cars and uh, airplanes, etc. So we have to begin to prepare for that. Now, of course, you'd expect me. I talked to my colleagues in the German Union, the IG Metal, who've given me an overview of the current situation. And to a certain extent, it's very much as has been said uh, by Heike. There are real problems, but Companies do continue to train their apprenticeships in the proper way, some of them by remote learning. And of course, the figures that Heike has showed make good reading in that sense, that the numbers are not as high as the number of apprentices being made redundant and are losing the jobs. It's good news from the German point of view compared to the UK. So what can we learn? And that's the question that was posed. And there was a comment there about whether this could be transposed into a UK style system. Well, having gone through um, a long time in industry, I've seen new systems come and go. I've seen cheap and cheerful uh, apprenticeship systems that have proved to be worthless. I've also seen uh, systems that were so rigid, uh, it really didn't take into account what needed to be done for the future. And so the TUC and the CSEU um, are of the view and unions that whilst we cannot just transplant the German system uh, into the UK structure, I see no reason at all why employers, why the sex of skills bodies, why further education uh, and the unions can't sit down and come up with a proposal uh, that would bring in the best of the German system with some more flexibilities that perhaps are going to be needed that will give us some stability uh, for the future. I think it can be done, Chair and colleagues, and I think it must be done because otherwise I think we'll just carry on in a cycle of, um, of uh, stop and go. We need absolute surety for the future. So thanks very much for listening and thanks very much for the invite uh, to myself to come along and express uh, uh, those views, which I'm sure for some people who might be on the call are controversial and I'm prepared to answer any questions on it. Thank you. Great, right. thanks very much indeed, uh, Tony. Those are really helpful perspectives. Thanks very much indeed. So if I could uh, call back, um, uh, Chiara as well as she's available but firstly perhaps we've got some questions that come in the chat we've got a, a bit of time now just to debate some of these questions and, and if I could go first perhaps to, to Heiger to Professor Solger um, there's just a, a couple of things just on the sort of changing German uh, system so the first question obviously Germany's ex absorbed very l large numbers of um, refugees in recent years and of course, historically, it had you know a large Gastarbeiter um, population brought into the German labour market. And one question is, how far have uh, the uh, decline in apprenticeship numbers uh, and now the COVID pandemic? How far have they differentially impacted upon Germany's 
uh, immigrant populations, it's new refugee populations. Uh, um, uh, and, and what might that tell us about the social inclusion challenges that you, that you face? So that's just one question I'd, I'd like to ask you. Um, and then the other, which is really to, to all of us, I think, um, is with the question of uh, increased automation, digital transformation of work, of course, one of the things we've seen is, is not simply that um, there's a sort of recomposition of the labour market, but there have been certainly in the UK, uh, the growth of jobs where uh, effectively the employer um, is no longer direct, directly responsible for the employee. They've made self-employed, uh, so-called gig economy jobs, um, and also in growth of jobs in sectors which are uh, far less amenable to the kind of long-term investment in young people that apprenticeship structures typically represent, that you've got much more uh, churn in the labour market, and certainly in the sort of lower levels of the British labour market, the flexibility that uh, is, has been part of our model for many, many years means it's inimical to uh, to investing in those workers and their, and their future in any sustained way in what would recognisably look like a, an apprenticeship programme. So I'm interested in this question about the sort of future composition of the apprenticeships and how they might relate to the challenges, not just of digitization of the gig economy, but to reaching parts of the labor market which have not had investment in skills and which have not been historically amenable to apprenticeship provision. So first, perhaps those those questions to, to Professor Solger. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for the questions and also thank you Chiara and Tony for the, um, the insights into the British system and the debate, so of course. Uh, so I must say, uh, even criticizing the German system very much, uh, I must say uh, it's still a good word uh, to have it. Um, uh, coming to the refugees and migrants, I think one has to differentiate. So the, the migrant population, so the second and third generations now we have from the what uh, was called the guest workers, um, they are actually a major population within the low achieving school leavers. So because they, they go to school and uh, in Germany and uh, we do see that they are over proportionally uh, leaving school with uh, lower school degrees. And so on the one hand, they are already uh, uh, affected by this low school achievement. But then uh, many studies show that they are additionally affected by being a migrant. So that is uh, still, and it is a market and it is applies to the labor market as it applies to the apprenticeship market. For the refugees, the situation is a little bit different because when you look at the refugee population that uh, came to Germany, they mainly came from countries without an apprenticeship or vocational training education system. So their education aspirations is to go to university. And in that, uh, even within the university, at certain fields that they uh, uh, look uh, much more into, it's less engineering, but it's much more med medicine, etc., which are very comp uh, competitive. So the first thing that uh, when they arrived in Germany was also to introduce the uh, new young incoming refugees. And I must say uh, one third of the incoming population is are young men. Uh, so they are in the age when they have to do either an apprenticeship or a university program. So when they start their career. So the first thing was to introduce them uh, that uh, blue color workers, uh, blue color jobs are good jobs in Germany. And that training is an investment also for these kinds of jobs. And I, what I have seen for the last figures, I think um, the system was uh, um, somewhat absor absorbed uh, these young people. So the number of, of uh, young people with the refugees uh, background uh, is increasing um, that do who do an apprenticeship and I must say it's there uh, not only the large job so they had programs where they started with an internship and then the internship was bridging them into apprenticeship positions it were also the small firms the craft firms um, so how that develops uh, further I don't know 
and for the gig economy and the changes as i as i said so first of all maybe the gig economy is larger in the uk than in germany i think the last figure i have seen is about five percent of the total employee population so it's not that large in germany uh, at the at, at this moment but what you have seen is that for the entire market only 20 percent of the firms train they train the 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 upcoming uh, generations for the entire market. So also the 80% of firms who do not train, of course, hire later on train people. So by that, I wouldn't, wouldn't say that the gig economy would be a major problem if, the, let's say, the traditional firms still are committed to provide training to young people. And that brings me to the levy. I mean, I think also in the chat, uh, there was a question whether that would solve the problem of free rider. No, it wouldn't it would, in this sense, but what it would, it would support the firm because now we have small, uh, smaller firms, especially now in the crisis, it would support those firms who, who train and to have a high quality training is that you cannot use the apprenticeship only as cheap as a cheap workforce, right? So you really have to train them and then training becomes costly. And so if every firm would uh, uh, contribute to that, to these costs, then of course the firms that do train could provide uh, better training. And we have one sector or not a subsector, the construction sector, that has something like that, where they put, where they collect the money from all firms and then uh, distribute it to the firms that do the training for the entire sector. So I, I think in this sense, it would somewhat solve the, the free rider problem. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And perhaps just on, on that point, Tony, I could just ask you, you know, why, why has the levy system not worked here in the way that it was anticipated? I mean, it was, it, it was a, de a trade union demand for many, many years to restore the levy system. And yet, yeah. what, what's, been, what's been the problem? Well, I think um, a number of reasons. I think that there was a lack of clarity from, from day one, really, about how it was going to operate. I mean, when it was announced, um, it, it was very unclear. Secondly, it is, as has been said, all one way. It's from the employer's side. Mm -hmm. I think because there's a lack of involvement of uh, trade unions in the Institute of Apprenticeships and also in other areas as well of, uh, of uh, skills training and apprenticeships, um, there is some misunderstandings uh, as, to, as to how it operates. I think the other problem was that some companies who contributed to the levy, our own union, our Unite, has apprentices in 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 uh, in uh, in the, the office when we're running in the offices primarily because of course we pay the apprenticeship levy and then we take apprentices on. I think there's been some real problems in some companies who didn't want to take apprentices on. One of the dif difficulties in the UK that we've had for years is they leave somebody else to do the training, and then. Um, in order to pick up the skilled people they need at some point, they offer higher wages uh, in order to cover that. And that's one of the difficulties. And of course, one of the other problems is, it's a trickle down. How is the supply chain going to be able to do the training as well when you know there are difficulties in making sure that that money comes down? I think there's been so many arguments about it. I think it could have been done better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there is a, uh, um, a mi some misunderstandings about it, but I don't think the government have been particularly clear uh, uh, on that. And also, can I just say while I'm speaking, look, this whole question of the gig economy, there are different, different um, uh, experience of it. In some companies, there are uh, uh, people who work on short term contracts, uh, who are part of a team to do a particular project, and they do that job and then move on so the next one, that which, which applies in, in Germany as well. But a gig economy in the UK, Nick and colleagues, is still seen as being a delivery, um, pizza delivery and fast food. Um, it's seen as being um, hotel hospitality, uh, short term. 
Uh, it's not actually developed in the way that people uh, do believe it actually has. And one of the problems, of course, because of the large numbers of agency workers, temporary, employ uh, temporary uh, and agency workers, and people in precarious employment, that's one of the reasons why it's let rip compared to Germany, of course, where there is a social model where the unions can have a say and say to the employers and to the government, no, you're not going to do this because it's not good for the country. In the UK, it's been let rip and you've seen the consequences of it. And of course, the big fear is now that we're out of the European Union. And I accept that we're outside of the EU and that's it. It is that the government will turn the UK into Singapore on Thames, as they as has been described. And that's the big fear. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. Chiara, can I can I ask you to come on in on these questions and perhaps, you know, qu quite directly, is it possible in the, in the labour market like the, the British labour market to sort of spread these forms of coordination between firms, the involvement of unions, long term investment in um, institutions that support apprenticeships? Is it possible really for us to consider that to be uh, plausible in the UK? Yeah, so... Um... I would say so, no, <laughs> not for the moment. So I think it's uh, more likely that the state, um, that the government will decide to intervene more than that uh, trade unions will be asked to join um, the negotiating table. But I also think that um, trade unions um, will, I mean, they, they can push more than they are doing so in that respect. I just have like, um, uh, a quick remark on the question, so why doesn't the apprenticeship levy work? Um, so I had mentioned it in the slides, so to be honest, look, I, I buy it only to a certain extent the fear of poaching argument. Um, the service indicate that this is not the main reason why employers in the UK um, don't train, so especially with after the introduction of the levy. Um, one of the issues that I was mentioning is that we, is a market so even if employers have their levy account so they might not find a training providers willing to provide good quality training to for them or training at all so especially for small and medium-sized enterprises because they um, depend on public funding which is directed to the training providers and the training providers do not have incentives to provide technical training. They want to provide training which is cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't want to invest in infrastructures. So I think we really need to, when we think about the vocational training system in the UK, we really need to, to, to talk more about the training providers as actors. So, mm -hmm. and they have their own interests. Mm -hmm. So, and, and over time, so the government has created this market for, uh, in order to deliver good value for money to employers, but actually a technical apprenticeship in the UK costs as much as a technical apprenticeship in Germany, where there is no market. Yeah. So, so we need to really, I think tra training providers is probably an answer to your question on the, on the levy. And in, uh, to your question on, so what should we do about the sectors which are less amenable uh, for apprenticeships? So I think in the last strategy paper, the government seems to be suggesting that they want to lower standards so that some sectors like the creative sector, they find difficult to commit to a 12 month apprenticeship. So they are thinking about um, uh, making a work experience um, um, count against a degree. Uh, I personally think that especially in terms of digital transformation and high occupational mobility, we need redundant knowledge employees need to, I, I think it's probably not a, too, a, a bad thing when employees feel that they are a bit overqualified when yeah. they have like broader knowledge so that they can change. So if we allow firms uh, to do apprenticeship of six months or two months, um, that's not an apprenticeship anymore. So it really undermines uh, the principle of the system. So I would be very, be very much in favor of the state and the government funding apprenticeship which do not rely on employers' commitment for those sectors, rather than lowering the standards just to have employers engaged at any cost. 
Very good point. Thank you, Carl. Very good point. Now, we've got about five minutes left, so we're nearly, nearly at the end. But um, I just wondered if my colleagues Hugh Lauder and, um, and Lynn Prince-Cook, who are on this call, who Jeremy mentioned earlier, want to chip in at this point and come into the conversation. Um, I think they're able to. Uh, you there, Lynn? Yep. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, thank you for this. It, it has me thinking on uh, multiple levels. In 1992, which I was counting on my hands while Heike was talking, is almost 30 years ago, when I was at Economic Development in Seattle, King County, Washington, we were talking about how to deal with the retraining needs, especially for those with less skills to begin with in their teen years, because we got to phrases lifelong learning, learn a living, the educated know how to train themselves. And so my concern when looking at your charts of gains and losses is the people who are already marginalized are going to need new unknown skills. I mean, the nature of technological transformation is, is daunting. How can apprenticeship prepare for that? And if we're having trouble getting employers to engage for young people at the start of the career, how are we going to get them to engage as people turn 30, 40, and 50? I mean, that to me are the challenges of this digitalization that's pending. Thanks very much, Lynn. That's a really good point. Um, Hugh, do you want to chip in with, with a point and then I'll ask uh, Heike to, to round us up uh, for the evening. Hugh. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks, Heiko. Tony, Chiara, very good. Um, I guess my point is, and it's a point that is well established in this country, and my colleague, who's well known to the policymakers, you at Keep, has rep repeated this point often, but it's the fundamental problem we have in this country is that you uh, employers are not actually committed to training by and large. I mean, clearly there are some uh, notable exceptions. And Chiara has made that point that the government actually had to have this intermediate market, as it were, of training providers, which are probably um, highly costly and not very efficient overall. So, Heiko, my question is, how is it possible for all the change in Germany for employers to sustain that commitment? Now, I know there's a kind of economic argument there, um, but I think there's also, well, my question is, is there also a commitment in terms of social norms, um, a sense of a concept of a society where employers have an integral commitment to the society, uh, which is not the case with um, the kind of market economy that we have in the UK. Thanks, Hugh. Well, um, Heike, can I ask you to pick up those points and then uh, and then I think we'll wrap, we'll wrap up the debate for the evening. Heike. Okay. Uh, I start with Lynn's uh, very good comment. Um, I think these are two questions. One is the retraining, and what we uh, we just uh, did an analysis with uh, PIA data, the adult uh, PISA, and what you do see is it's less the skills of the people and their learning motivation that uh, explains differences between low-skilled and skilled workers, whether they um, participate in further training. It's really the workplace. It's what kind of contracts you have, what job tasks you have, uh, the firm, what the firm is doing. So, and I think that is a good news because that can be much easier change than uh, uh, because there you can handle politically uh, to change uh, work conditions. And I guess that's also something where trade unions can, and the government, as Chiara said, can be very important. The other issue is how to prepare the next generation, you know, when they start. And I think um, on the one hand, I would say the German system could provide that because the German system on the one hand is occupation specific, but on the other hand, it is also um, the, the students or the apprentices who finish uh, also have a higher secondary education degree because they also have math, they have political science, they have German, so they have major subjects of upper secondary education all the within the three years of training. And of course you could think about more, so what I would argue is that we need more the less specialized occupations we have now so that 
you start broader and then in the last year you specialize because then it gets easier also in the future career you only need small pieces and not entirely three years again and uh, for the uh, and but but i must say it's very difficult with the uh, with both social partners the employers and the trade unions they stay with the system for different reasons. So to change such a system, it's also, of course, risky. You never know what is the outcome. And for youth uh, questions, yes, there are also studies showing it, that it is not only economically uh, why firm train. Uh, I think uh, also a colleague uh, of you in, in London, um, Christian Dustmann has shown it's also kind of societal norm. And what you could see is also that uh, employers themselves are socialized in such a system, right? Um, and that decreases a little bit because we used to have also uh, at the CEO level, people who started with an apprenticeship and then made all the way up. So they were socialized in the system that has changed uh, over time. But still, I think there is this commitment and the other it's mixed. So they, in, in contrast to what Tony was saying for the UK, the German employers are very proud to have this high skill equilibrium. So not to produce this cheap stuff, but to produce the more complex. And if it is more complex, you need more skilled labor force. And what you also see in the debate and also in the predictions we do not only need people from the from the universities to keep that kind of economy, uh, high quality uh, products, but also the people with skills um, uh, with skills at the medium level. And I think that is also something that uh, keeps the system alive. Great. Well, thank you very much in, indeed, Professor Solger, and um, thank you again for your lecture this evening. Um, uh, it's a real privilege for us to have you at the University of Bath as a global chair, and I hope at some point we're able to welcome you uh, in person to the university and not just uh, in a Zoom call. That would be really great. Uh, but thank you for joining us from Berlin this evening. It's been very, very good of you. And I want to also thank um, Tony Burke and Chiara Banassi for their contributions. It's great to hear uh, from a perspective from the trade unions uh, and from Chiara talking uh, from a perspective of um, British management relations, human relations. And, uh, you know, the, these debates are ones that, that we have um, periodically in the UK. And it's to be hoped that through this kind of discussion, we can actually make some more progress substantively, uh, because as we know, particularly in, in an economic crisis of the kind we've been experiencing, unemployment crisis, is always young people who are first into the crisis and last out. Uh, and it's really critical, therefore, that uh, these issues of providing decent apprenticeship places and ensuring young people stay in employment are maintained. So thanks very much indeed for your time this evening to all of our panelists and participants. Um, thank you, Professor Solger. Uh, and thank you for watching us and do stay tuned. And we'll have uh, a report and a podcast, as I said at the beginning of tonight's uh, lecture and responses up on our website shortly. So thanks very much indeed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Bye.